advice. Uh, there are kind of two approaches that you can take. One is subtractive, where you'd be cutting off a, a solid block of material. So this machine here uses a subtractive approach. So we start with a block of stock, and we carve it away until we get the piece that we want. Another benefit of subtractive is that you're starting with often a very industrial material, like a solid block of metal, as Chris said. So as you carve that away, it keeps those inherent properties and strengths of that material. Additive, of course, is even more magical in some ways. And you may have heard of the MakerBot, which is probably the most popular CNC project to date. With the MakerBot, it's additive in that you are laying down layers of plastic to build up an object from a void. So in this case, you start with nothing and effectively print out an object. Very exciting. But at the same time, you're limited by the physical characteristics of those layers of plastic. ABS is pretty strong, not quite as strong if you squirt it down in multiple layers as opposed to an injection molding, for example. So this is a kit you can buy online, I think, for about $1,000. You can print anything about the size of a cupcake. It's also attached to a really incredible website called Thingiverse, where people upload designs that anybody else can use for free. Um, and again, just to go over the, the overall process of going from a digital design to a physical object. Um, so we talked before about CAD, so it's computer-aided design. So it's using um, digital software tools to either make a drawing, or in this case, this is a 3D scan of someone's face. So there are a lot of tools now that, um, kind of like a digital camera, and you can snap a three-dimensional representation of an object and bring it into the computer. Um, so this would be one example of working in software with a digital design, so it's just a digital representation of something that may or may not someday be physical. Okay, so on the left you can see the 3D scanning still has not mastered the mustache and the various hairs in this guy's face, but nonetheless he soldiers forward, that's tool pathing on the right, but we're saying if we carve the set with a bit that has a certain width, a certain profile, it needs to be this far away from the surface at all times, so we set up a set of paths for the tool to follow. And we follow this up often with a rough cut on the one hand on the left side, followed by then maybe a finished pass on the right hand side. That will often incorporate a change of bit. So you might start with a square end to knock down all the basic material, and then a ball end on the right to finish. It just depends on how intense that result is you're looking for. Here, clearly, this piece is not supposed to snap fit into something else, uh, unless this project went out to get really complicated. And so he's looking for that aesthetic result, and therefore, if he looks at that and says, good enough, it's good enough, not necessarily an engineering application. So, uh, just to talk a little bit more about our specific experience with this project. Um, in our uh, estimate, a lot of existing do-it-yourself CAD CAM projects um, have a little bit of conflict in terms of their goals. Sure, so you've got as inexpensive as possible, we mentioned this earlier, as accurate as possible. But also this notion of open versus closed and intellectual property. So this is where I really put my hippie head on. I should untuck my shirt for this part. The, uh, this notion that um, false scarcity is the thing that drives a lot of contemporary design. So if you make a CNC design, and one of the only ways you make money is to sell that design, of course, it's not necessarily in your interest to let others have access to it. Participant, I'm doing this downstairs in the basement to the growing safer community science fair. So, um, Down the basement in room M. Yeah. Okay, so open, so open source, you may have heard a lot about if anyone subscribes to Wired Magazine, Lamar Freed is one of our new, um, sort of the uh, new faces of open design. She has a great PowerPoint about 10 different businesses that all make a million dollars a year each and still give all their plans away from free. So it's a really exciting moment where you can take advantage of the potential of sharing digital files as opposed to trying to keep them to yourself as effectively as possible. And our question, can or should the design be all three at once? You can probably guess our answer is no. So here's some, uh, a, a few more concrete examples of uh, do-it-yourself, uh, either 3D printing or scene strapping, basically CAD CAM projects that are in existence. Um, the lower left, I think that's an example of one that's, that's built for very, very cheap. Um, you can see it's also extremely small. Um, so there's, there's always kind of a trade-off between uh, the priorities that people are trying to maximize. There's also, for the engineers in here, a lot of different solutions to the same issue. So if we need to move something in three dimensions, you have to ask yourself, do I move the tool in three dimensions, do I move the stock in three dimensions, or a combination of the two? On the upper right, you can see that one of the axes for the tool is fixed, meaning that that drawing moves back and forth, that's one direction, and the tool can move at 90 
angle threes and then also up and down. Just another example. There's so many of these designs out there. Some of them are a great idea and some are terrible. I found a proposal to make one out of granite so it wouldn't vibrate as much. You know, some of them, like I said, foam core, that's really walking all over the map. And again, back to intellectual property, some of these are free, others, you know, people charge you 10, 20, maybe 100 bucks just to get the plants, not even the machine itself, but just to get the part descriptions and the part system. So then you'll it yourself. So we come to Stuart McFarland's design down here in the lower right. Uh, Chris and I were both working together at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. We wanted to uh, show students that they could make something more exciting than uh, squares at a mason length with a laser cutter. And we thought it would be a good idea to make a CNC machine with the CNC machine because laser cutters are another example. So we wanted to start from plans that were free. We found these in the lower right on instructables.com. Here's their website. And you can see that later on in the lower right we get a list of them as well. So Stuart was kind enough to give these away for free, but they were also attached to what's known as a Creative Commons license. You can take that. Sure. So um, again, the, the plans that this design are based on were released on instructables.com with a Creative Commons license, which is basically an alternative to copyright, and it lets authors um, of any kind of intellectual property, so music, movies, images, uh, CNC plants, um, it lets them specify with a little bit more granularity how other people can use their intellectual property. Um, so in Stewart's case, he, he put his plans up on Instructables and he said it was okay for anyone to download the plans, redistribute them, make modifications of them, even if it was for commercial purposes, as long as they attributed uh, you know, any derivatives to him. Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He's, he's such a sharing guy um, in some ways, but then we found out after thinking we knew him for a couple years online that Stuart McFarland wasn't even his real name. So I accidentally met him at a conference once, but I don't think I could reveal his actual name. Okay, so in addition to the plans themselves, we're trying to keep what we call the stack free. So there's a lot of software involved, there's hardware involved. Clearly nothing as free as a beer, but you want to get as close as you can. So this is like cnc.org, one of these few great examples where the government produces a really complex piece of software and then releases it to the public. ENC is what's known as machine control software that's attached to the Linux operating system, also free. So you can build yourself a small computer, uh, cost of parts, put Linux on there for free, EMC as well. Right, so we're actually controlling this machine with software that's 100% free. Um, there's a couple other steps in the software process that can or can't be free depending on how you want to do it, um, and we'll cover those you know, more specifically after we've done talking. Yeah, we've got a fully free example at the end, of course, with free always comes a little more. Uh, so here's our first build, um, made out of passion, half inch acrylic, I still can't remember why. We had it, looks great. Great. it looks great. It looks great. It was a terrible idea. It uh, laser cuts pretty well. We had direct access to a laser cutter. But in this particular first design from Stuart, you had to take that half inch on it in and then drill in with a quarter inch drill bit with very, very little room for air. And then once you got maybe an inch or an inch and a half deep, you had to drop in what we refer to as IKEA barrel nuts. At least that's the only place I've ever seen it. So you drop them in and you kind of come in from the side with a big screw. Unfortunately, all this hand working just gave lots of opportunities for error. And uh, Brie Pettis from MakerBot has a, a nerdy uh, name for working with acrylic, which is the binary fail, which is if you push it just a little too far, it just breaks and it's either broken or it's not. And therefore, when you move to something like Masonite, which has the soft fail, you can crush it and squeeze it and break it a little bit and it'll still get most of the job done until you totally try. Yeah, so after building a, a full acrylic version, we decided to switch to masonite, which is way cheaper, um, it's easier to laser cut, and uh, to get rid of those horrible IKEA nuts, um, we switched over to this uh, technique for doing 90 degree joint work, where we're putting these taps and slots together and then just screwing them with machine screws. Um, that's a really great, kind of quick and dirty way to do a 90 degree connection with flat material. If, if you take a look at our CAD plans, it makes a lot of sense how to get this done, but if you want something that's a little more direct, you can go on Instructables and look at how to make absolutely anything with acrylic and machine screws. I can give them a uh, link once that Stuart McFarland also posted about that. Uh, one more note of this original, you can see there's that big red object. We actually produced that with an additive machine. So we took a uh, really expensive uh, laser scanner, looks kind of like a hair dryer, we scanned the side of our Dremel so we could get a, a mating part exactly right and printed that on a rapid prototyper. Not exactly a bit towards accessibility, but it looks pretty cool. 
So as we work this thing forward, as we're trying to make it easier and easier for anybody, including you to build, uh, one of the ideas was to make sure that we're just using common components. So here you can see these are uh, hard drive uh, power cables. Also, you know, a little hard to work with, so we might change these at some point, but anybody can get them in a micro center. Yeah, and a lot of the issues that we faced uh, building off the planes were constructibles were, you know, the planes were pretty complete, but you could get to a point and you'd say, oh wait, we don't have the wires to connect the motors to the computer or something like that. So we tried to go back and be a lot more thorough and make sure that every little step was spelled out. Okay, so right now the current version of little CNC is uh, version 1.03. Uh, you can go to our website at this moment and download these plans. If you have direct access to a laser cutter, you can get it done uh, probably before dinner. <laughs> but then, if you need to use an online service bureau, there's a couple of other options as well, and we'll get into that. So here's one of the demos that we'll do today. But let me play a little video to show this to you in the meantime. And I'm bummed that I, I brought the video without sound. The sound is out. It's fine. It's right, we'll have live sound in there. Yeah. So this is the pen plot. Uh, one of the benefits in an uh, environment like this is it doesn't create any dust. And it's what we call a two and a half access drawing, where um, you do use Z just a little bit to pick up the pen and put it down for the most part for making it a, a two-dimensional tool. Um, and this also illustrates another really interesting aspect of this project, which is that it's not just for uh, being a cutting device. It's really easy to adapt this design to put whatever kind of tool you want on this. So in this case, it's a pen. Uh, you know, I could see also something uh, really interesting happening with an extrusion device. You could actually turn this into something that could 3D print. Um, and that's just one of, the, one of the many pluses of having this design here on our website for free that anyone can take and modify, you know, basically however they want, as long as they attribute us and the previous authors. Also, Chris and I are really interested, I mean, those are kind of vanilla applications as amazing as they can be. We're really interested to see what people can do moving beyond what engineers allow for a tool to perform. So, for example, one of my projects involved a six-foot-wide sledgehammer operated keyboard for typing via USB. Uh, Chris once built a uh, wind-powered guillotine for a green political incentive. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it's this great intersection of not down, but coming uh, laterally to art um, and getting exposure to people who aren't going to necessarily use it for the right applications. Um, and having a rig that is relatively cheap, we're not so worried about breaking it, we're not so worried about doing the, the quote unquote wrong thing, um, which really allows us to push the limits of the technology um, to get some interesting results for art and engineering purposes. Yeah, in a funny way, these tools are a lot safer than a, 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 a table saw, for example. Especially if you can build this into an enclosure, you can start it out, and pretty much the worst thing that would happen is that you break a yeah, five up. So here's an example of uh, milling that uh, common Home Depot pink insulation foam. We built this device so it had just about enough Z, a little more than two inches, in order to get a good grab on that material. Now we still have some fancy stuff in here. Chris used that same scanner to uh, scan a pair. And a pair was a great example too, because unlike a cartoon pair, it's impossible even to represent it just with two halves. If you think about how this tool works, it can't rotate around an object, so it has to come up and over. Therefore, if you ever have an undercut in a shape, you have to break that out into multiple pieces. So this pair is actually four different sections that had to get carved down individually and then glued together at a later date than today. So, so yeah, so. Visually, this is a little bit, there's less instant gratification here compared to drawing with a pen because uh, you're going through lots of iterations of just carving away um, kind of the negative material. Uh, but eventually, with this, with this process, you'll get down to this really fine pass, which you can see here, um, and you'll actually get that nice surface of a uh, piece of fruit.
So accessibility is the big thing we're bringing to it. We're artists and educators, so we want a low technical bar to entry, an active and enthusiastic community, which we'll get into in a second. Realistic costs, depending on who you ask, everyone has their own idea. Depending on your access to a laser cutter, this is about 700 bucks in parts, but we don't get any of that. So the idea is we're not selling it, although we will sell some parts to it that require laser cutting, but you can do it totally on your own. And uh, carefully crafted instructions are valuable to make it do. Right, and again, just to, to tie back to some of our experiences looking at other uh, do-it-yourself CAD CAM projects, um, a lot of times for a maker, it's such an endeavor just to get to something, get to a point where something actually works, that they just, you know, collapse on the garage floor and, and never really touch it again. Um, so we kind of, <laughs> we kind of uh, took pains to uh, make sure that we documented every step of this process in a way that we could hand it off to someone else and they could really easily follow along the process and then actually build their own machine. Um, we coupled that with uh, a pretty robust uh, web presence where we have a really great forum. So people who are interested in building this, people who have built this, people who are currently building this, can come to our forum and talk and communicate with each other. Um, and it's, I mean, we've really been blown away with the, the response that we've gotten on the forum. I mean, it's literally people from all over the world talking to one another, um, trying to troubleshoot, trying to source parts. Um, and so it's just really cool to be able to help foster that kind of yeah, when a, when a guy named Butch from South Africa showed up, yeah, it's like, <laughs> made my weekend. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of, uh, I don't know if this is the right time to talk about it, there's a lot of people requesting different ideas. So as we try to move the project towards next steps like version 2 and so forth, we're trying to set up a structure where users can say, I want to be able to build that with metric parts, I want limit switches, I want uh, collapsible based portability, and so on. And we actually just uh, listened to a Kickstarter campaign yesterday try and get that going. So we'll talk about that at the end. But the exciting thing is to try to have it respond to the community, rather than we make something, we totally keep it to ourselves and try to milk every last dollar out of that project. Well, the dollars are nice. <laughs> so here's our instruction set. That could be either of our hands. So it's my hand. But it could be. <laughs> and the website, just a couple of examples. Uh, not a whole lot of different pages. The forum's probably where the most exciting stuff is at. Uh, so we've got some examples of active build logs. Uh, we just started offering laser cutting. We're trying to get that, that product off the ground. And you'll also see pictures in there where people, like there's a guy in Canada who found a laser shop. We don't ship abroad. So he said, hey, everybody, they've got good rates. And people you know, work it out that way instead of uh, feeding in a negative way. Yeah, so our niche is really for someone, um, you know, it's not really for the higher end CNC folks. So it's not really, not really aiming towards someone who already knows all this stuff. Um, it just wants a version to have in their house because you could go out and buy one of these machines, you know, desktop size for probably a couple grand. And if you know what you want, it's not that hard. But you know, we are looking for someone who might have a little bit of technical chops, you know, might know their way around the shop, but wants to learn more about um, digital fabrication. So here's the example of the downloads page. Uh, we have some older versions in there which are pretty similar. And then down beneath this, if you go online and scroll down, we've also got a bunch of examples that people have sent back in. I'll get to a specific one in a second. Uh, but it's really great when you give something away for free to see how the bar lowers in terms of what other people will do for free. So one guy just called and expressed interest. And he said, well, I don't think it's quite good enough for me yet, but I'm going to wait until version 2. And then a couple weeks later, he said, oh, also, I converted it all to STL, and I made all the parts parametric, and here's a really high quality <laughs> render. And he went back. So it's, it's really funny to see what people will do. I mean, even if we charged one cent for this, it would be really, really different in terms of the, the base plans. So it's, it's been a really interesting road trying to craft a sustainable model around it while keeping that a conceptual form. And there's the, those are all the gantry parts. So. Right, so one thing that we found after releasing this was that it, it's a degree more difficult than we thought for people to get access to laser cutters, you know, throughout the country. So we were very spoiled in that, um, you know, we worked directly in a, an institution that had ready access to laser cutters pretty much whenever we wanted to. Um, we found for other people, though, it, it can be quite difficult and expensive to source uh, from, you know, a private company that offers laser cutting. So we recently started selling uh, pretty limited quantities of um, pretty discounted laser cutter parts that can then be used uh, along with hardware from third parties to, to build a kit. So the advice I always give is, and especially here at a university, walk out the front door and look for an architect that's really hungry. And uh, they'll probably be able to get it done. Or Thursday. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, so here's Instructables. Uh, we showed uh, Stuart McFarland's plans. Here's ours. We actually um, we were fine using our own website for a while, but then uh, somebody <laughs> posted a, was starting to post our plans because they're free and there's no limitation technically. So they're trying to post our plans in order to win prizes on other websites. And we just wanted to make sure that the prizes didn't get too distributed that way. So we put our put the real project online just to say here's the baseline and now everybody. Good, and that's more of it as a quality control and audience. Well, it's also interesting that it, it kind of comes full circle. You know, we based this off of the design that we found on Instructables. Um, so, you know, kind of in all fairness, we should feedback, even though it's already up on our own site, right. um, to, to have a post on Instructables. But it's interesting, when we were starting this at the uh, Art Institute, they weren't quite sure what to do with something that was open source. They didn't really know what this term meant, neither did we really. And they said, well, you know, now that it's starting to get some attention, we want you to sort of don't distribute it as freely. And we said, hey man, you know, it's, it's gone. Like the second that comes up online for 30 seconds, it's not coming back. So it's not as though we harbor uh, fantasies about controlling it in that way, but it raises interesting questions about, you know, you still want people to trust that when they download the file, it will function correctly. So how do you balance those two? Um, so getting to some more examples of uh, contributions from the community. Um, Right after we released the very first version of this design into the public, um, the model of Dremel tool that we spec was discontinued. Um, so you can see, I think the one on top was the original one that we included with the plans. Um, the lower one was the, the new version that, that went into production right after we pulled the plans out. Um, so this kind of threw a wrench into our uh, design because it has a different profile shape. So we have parts on here that um, kind of marry with the, the Dremel tool to keep it nice and vertical over the, the cutting surface. Um, and the new model did not fit into that uh, that contour. Imagine a giant boardroom. It's a little so it switches this year. I just know it. <laughs> so here's uh, Bill Hastings, who was one of our first uh, early adopters. And he got involved through an organization called Tech Shop. I think it's largely in the West Coast, but it's starting to spread, maybe even in Detroit as well where you get together a whole bunch of industrial level tools in the space and you can kind of rent a table, I eat sort of like a, a health club membership. And so he was uh, building one there and he got this work done on his own and then just sent us back effectively a CAD file. I'm using that loosely and this is in a Adobe Illustrator format because it's, it's we're cutting it out of sheet material. So he sent this back, no strings attached, and uh, nor could he attach strings because the nature of our uh, Creative Commons license is that if you derive from this work, all that attribution has to stay and your derivations also have to be open. So it's a kind of good way of preventing anybody from uh, shutting it down. And I think the awesome thing about this is that you know this is a design problem that was solved not by us but by someone who just happened upon a design. And it's just this awesome, like, kind of otherworldly uh, design from the ether that we seem to have created. It's also really good to see this room because for about the first year, I think, it was men between 59 and 61 <laughs> was the, uh, the audience, so it's, it's good to uh, gather a larger group. Here's another example of a page somebody put up where they just contribute what they happen to be comfortable with. So this guy clearly, I think he, made, he literally made this in a day, and it was one of two sites. So he wrote to us and said, effectively, I know you can't say no, but I just wanted to know if it was okay if I go ahead and register lalcnc.com, and I think he got it done that as well. And so there's this really, yeah, again, people do work for free because we do work for free. They recognize that we don't have technical control over the project, so they ask, as opposed to us having control and battling things out and so forth. He put this up just to document his build um, and to sort of bolster that community when he's not as much of a hardware guy, it's more of a software guy. So we've had a lot of um, really, really interesting, you know, concrete examples of other people from literally all over the world who have built their own versions of this design. Um, you can see all this stuff here. Uh, it's, it seems to be growing pretty steadily. Um, and I think we have some examples of your pictures of it. Yeah, we do. We've not pictured, I mean, there's a bunch actually in Michigan. I know a guy, uh, Paul Kirchner, I think, is associated with the Hackerspace I3. So, uh, and there's a one, I think one at University of Michigan, so there's some in the area. This is South Africa, Charles Howe. Uh, he made his with an enclosure, of course, which we didn't spec. He just decided that of his own. And I love seeing the living rooms come out and stuff like the, uh, the one we showed earlier that was on white carpet. <laughs> yeah, so this was the first one that we saw internationally, which um, 
I can only imagine what's a big challenge getting some of that hardware. But uh, again, it's really cool that we can transmit this thing across the ocean and someone else can just take it and build it. Um, again, just I think a testament to giving things away for free. Yeah, he had to spec all of the uh, parts, he had to change them over into metric measurements. The software can handle the transition to metric no problem, but all of the hardware he had to just figure out. And uh, he didn't complain about it, he just did. Here's an example in Canada, a group called Open Forum Architecture. I think we had that kind of show in Chicago. They built one uh, pretty much as a lark, but they also ended up actually making interesting things with it. For example, this piece of foam, sorry, that's really washed out. And you can see the difference between uh, polygon modeling on the right and herb style modeling on the left. Uh, we can get into that gearhead stuff later if you guys want. There's, there's Bill Hastings. So Bill Hastings, he's the guy who uh, fixed our Dremel problem. Um, and then he, I think, was the first one to, to do a completed build. Is that right? I think that might be. Yeah. yeah. So, he, so he took this... Uh, he took this build to Maker Fair at San Mateo. And uh, it was another thing where he just let us know he was going to do it. Which presents really interesting issues for me as a new assistant professor on the tenure track. Can I take credit for that? Uh, I'm going to find a way. <laughs> so, but he did. He did unsolicited. He, he put our URL right across the, the front of his machine. Um, he also made a sneeze guard, <laughs> which you can barely see there. I thought it was a finger guard. Here's a little uh, example of him making a pen plot. So in modern media, you only know if something's real if the camera shakes, or you'll see his finger creep onto the top of the frame. <laughs> so he did some drawing. I think he uh, redesigned the pen plot as well. You can see it's clear. He was making an RC plane in both parts. Maybe just a, one more example. Ah, so Sly. Yeah. Sly was one of our builders who had a really great attitude where he saw the project as a place to start, but he didn't feel that the things that were lacking, at least in his mind, were a problem or somehow a poor reflection of the project. Rather, they were areas for him to identify his genius and then, uh, and then carry it forward. So in some cases, you know, he's uh, guilty of overbuilding. You can see him stacking up these 16 bearings on the upper right in order to accomplish something that could probably, probably be done with a plain bolt. But he did have some really uh, moments of brilliance. You can see in the lower right, he uh, made a clamp for this belt. If you look at the front of our machine, you can see that we require uh, pieces of aluminum square tubing. It's just another part to buy and manufacture. And he did it with little tiny pieces of laser cut wood. We've also got uh, finger joints down there in the lower left, so that way you can cut this thing out in a smaller laser bed to put it together and dissolve larger objects. And he also just spent a ton of money. You can see the rails in the upper left are these kind of rails that grab. So if you take that machine and try to push it off its moorings, it won't go because it's, it's grabbing on uh, with its bearings. But yeah, he, he made all these uh, changes on his own, reposted all the documentation to our site, and everybody won. Yeah, he really took it and ran with it. Ran with it. It's pretty cool. And then here's an example of how much faster he can run his. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so like we said, we're interested in alternative CAD CAM applications. Uh, after all, this um, approach to making things has been around for a while. We're the most interested in art design and these unclassifiable applications. We've heard uh, proposals for starting your own tombstone etching business, uh, making a robot that can climb up an electric uh, telephone pole and carve a totem as it goes. Um, there's some other ones that we can't talk about. <laughs> right, but we're really at this interesting uh, kind of tipping point where lots more people are getting access to this kind of technology, um, and we're just really excited to see uh, where people take it uh, as far as the applications. So this is an image I found. Um, I love this image, even as it sort of makes my eyeballs dry out. But the, uh, I just think it's an example of where somebody has really high technical skill and you can really do anything on a tool like this, but I think you're not seeing people that have both necessarily all of the artistic background and all of the technical background to make something like this 
uh, come out as a face melting solo as you're looking for. <laughs> we do have some examples of these that we've been able to find that are slowly happening in more and more schools. Uh, you want to take some? Sure, so this is um, an example of a uh, bench from California College of the Arts. Um, and again, we've been lucky enough to kind of be uh, incubators in these academic institutions that are pushing um, a lot of good resources towards these sorts of tools. Um, so we've gotten to see some pretty cool examples of uh, students and faculty making things. Um, this is another one from uh, CCA. This is a, uh, I think it's supposed to be a lion, right? Yeah, but right. everyone thinks it's I a thought it was a bear, bear, but you can go inside and I think there's a little uh, projection that, that goes uh, where the, uh, the bear slash lion's face would be. Um, this is, I think, made out of uh, plywood. So I, I think this student went through probably like a pallet's worth of um, plywood sheets to, to make this thing. But um, yeah, really expensive. But again, just, you know, um, it's really interesting to see these kinds of new applications that. Uh, May or may not be possible with more traditional uh, shop tools. And you know, we'll, we'll, we'll laugh with a, a laughing with kind of perspective about someone who clearly does such an awesome project, and then there's some funny aspect about like overbuying this or what have you. But the fact of the matter is, there's no experts in this area, right? I mean, the fact that we're speaking on this topic sort of writes that. <laughs> Um, so you can see a lot of great examples where people are just trying to figure out what's this for, what does it do, uh, what's interesting about it. It's really easy to make multiples, right, because the repeatability of CAD CAM is uh, really nice. So here you can make a single form and then have it change slightly over time without spending just years and years constructing it. Uh, here's an example. This is Michael Geith. I'm not sure where he's at right now. York University. Yeah, York University. And, um, we're actually talking about not just artistic applications, but potentially the ability to print organs and things that people could use in a much more uh, fraught environment. Yeah, and Michael Beck's done some really interesting things. Can we see the next one? Um, kind of combining these medical uh, medical imaging techniques with jewelry. Um, so this is a cool example of a bracelet. I think the next one is the one I want to talk about. Is there anything else you want to say? On this one. Um, yeah, so he's, he's combining um, medical images of humans and animals um, with different materials. So this, this, these bracelets are, are my favorite. They kind of hug uh, the surface of the skin. Um, it does is connected by them to your silicone or something. Right, yeah, so they're flexible um, combined with hard materials, um, which again just points to the, uh, the potential of these sorts of applications where you can you know, mill hard, strong materials, you can 3D print um, flexible materials and combine them together, um, get some really interesting results. So, um, you may have seen this on the uh, Colbert Report, uh, Brie from MakerBot actually had uh, Stephen Colbert's head 3D scan was inside, and then they released his face as an open source 3D model on the Thingiverse. Which you can then get in there and remix. Of course, we uh, usually think of remixing in terms of images and music. Uh, but here he was uh, remixed into a, uh, a bear. And uh, there's tons more examples of that. This is just one of the And then this is an example from uh, the School of Art Institute where Taylor and I both work. Um, this is a CNC routed enclosure uh, that houses these little light receptors um, that change as you move about the space. And I think they said it like to do. Uh, Coffee making demo. Um, <laughs> is this one of the ones that went to Milan? Yes, it did. It went to some design show in Milan. So, yeah, they, they bought something like 20 identical fluorescent green hard shell suitcases to carry this. This is a great piece. Uh, I'm going to go. Uh, man, I'm going to put his name instead of looking at it. Mangrano Valley. And UIC in Chicago. And does all these things related to uh, geology and the weather and natural phenomena. So this was an iceberg. I'm afraid I don't have a full shot of this thing, but it was two stories tall. And all those little joints were manufactured with a rapid prototyping system. And then all the measurements were created digitally and then uh, fabricated. So this um, it is sort of like the digital equivalent of an actual iceberg that was somehow uh, captured out there. A great little example of a flat pack design, something you'll commonly see in a CNC. Uh, this one was pieces you can snap out of a sheet in order to construct a hammer in order to snap the pieces out of the sheet. Uh, at which point I think you're back. <laughs> All right, so um, that's the first part of our talk. So thank you for listening to that. Um, now go to one.
at DIYLSCNC.org. Uh, yeah, do you definitely check out the website, um, especially if you have any interest in building one. Uh, also, um, take a look at our Kickstarter campaign. We're trying to get some funds together to build version two of this. Um, so if you got some spare change, we would uh, be much obliged. Yeah, I'll just point out one quick thing about the uh, self-promotion uh, here, and then we'll tell you some more interesting stuff in the live demo. Uh, in, in addition to the swag that you tend to find in a project like Kickstarter, we're trying to roll out version 2 of the project. So you can actually vote for particular design improvements. Uh, you can also do write-in votes, so if you want this thing to do something that we haven't thought of yet, you can make that suggestion using Kickstarter. This we'll also name a part yeah. of it after you. This is our favorite one to donate. The only yeah, thing to go uh, yeah. a Johnson flange. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you have a really uh, <laughs> really that's nice awesome. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so check that out if you get a chance. Now, so that's the initial part, now comes the noisy demo part. But uh, should we address any questions first? Q&A, uh, we'll get set up for demo. Sounds good. So does anybody want to shoot some questions out there before we get this thing running? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, in terms of how to actually make this run? No. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so what we're going to demonstrate is I, I got a picture. Who did I take a picture of? Hey, I'm going to share it. Well, anyway, we took, a, we took a photograph. We're going to convert that photograph into tool paths and then just make a drawing of it. We're not demonstrating a 3D object just because it's dirty and messy. I just use it in a journal. That's what we've got right now, so the design currently has the parts necessary to strap in a Dremel. As someone pointed out,